and now we'll have Chaitza yeah. uh, speaking about what's new in my SQL optimizer 8.0. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as she said, I'm Chaitra. I work with uh, MySQL Optimizer team. I've been with Oracle for about six years now. So today I'll be talking about uh, the most important features that we have delivered as part of A.O. So. <coughs> so that's the safe harbor statement for you guys to just a disclaimer. Oh, <laughs> it's not visible, is it? Ah, okay, yeah. perfect. Okay, so that's the agenda for today. So I'll be covering some new SQL syntax that we have added as part of A.O, and then some improvements that we have made uh, compared to 5.7 in A.O. So the first and the most important one we have added is the common table expression also known as the CTE. So what's a CTE? It's an alternative to a derived table, typically used. Um, so a derived table is something that you're going to use in your from class. Sorry. So, so as a subquery. So you, you do your selects and in your from class, you're going to specify a subquery, which will be treated as a derived table. Now, um, how does CTE differentiate itself from derived table? So how, um, how do we specify a CTE? So we start with the with keyword, and then you specify the derived table name, and then you give the subquery definition that you want to use. And then that's followed by the actual select query, which uses this derived table. So, uh, and a CTE may precede any of the DML operations. I'll just show you an example later on how you can actually use CTE. So when you have a derived table, why do you actually need a CTE? So I have listed out a couple of reasons why, do, why a CTE is better to be used than a derived table. So the first and foremost is the better readability. So uh, whenever you are reading a select query, if you, if you want to write a derived table, then you have a select inside your actual select which is using this derived table. Select star from, and then you have another select, and then you use your derived table. But whereas in CTE, there is a clear distinction. You have your derived tables ahead of the actual select query that is using this derived table. So that is one thing. And better readability, as you know, leads to better maintenance. And the second one is the, it can be referenced multiple times. So uh, you have one single definition of your derived table, and then you can use it. Uh, in your, so this becomes your initial data set. And you, you do a union with the second select, which is actually your recursive select. So the recursive select works on the first uh, uh, seed select and then recursively produces the subset of the uh, final result. Um, usually the recursive select actually has a breakout condition. You can specify a where clause until when you want to produce the rows. So I have a simple example here, printing 1 to 10. So how do you do that? with recursive, and you have your uh, recursive uh, CTE's name, select one. So the first seed select is one, and then union all, and then you have select one plus A from this CTE. So it produces, and then you have your where condition. So the first iteration will produce one row. The second iteration, it will have one and two. The third iteration, until it breaks out till 10. And then you have your final uh, actual select query using this CTE. But uh, uh, this is a simple example, but CT, recursive CT helps you actually in real uh, examples, uh, you can use it to traverse in hierarchical data. So you know, how many uh, subordinates are there for this particular VP, or who is the underused VP, who is the overused VP, so on and so forth. So that's something that is introduced in A.0. So the next one is the windowing functions. How many of you have heard or used windowing functions here? So it's something that is used in analytics, basically. Um, I'll just show you how, what's a window function and how it can be used. So a typically, a regular aggregation, grouped aggregation, happens this way. That is, you have multiple rows for a single group, and then all these are aggregated 
collapsed and you will have one row which has the final aggregate that is you have uh, say for example you have sum of salaries then you group accordingly and then you give the final salary in one row what happens with respect to your window function window function doesn't do this it does not collapse the rows it actually keeps the identity of all the individual rows that contributed for that particular group along with that it also gives the aggregation so that's what uh, windowing function does um, it uh, as the definition says it actually sees all the rows however you define it in your window class uh, the uh, the rows that are in the vicinity of that current row so i have some example which can be used to understand so the first let's see the syntax of what um, how a windowing function looks like so as you see here i am just doing a select name comma department id salary and i have uh, sum of salary as department total from employees and order by so how does a windowing function differentiate itself from a regular grouped aggregate so you have to specify this over clause so the moment you specify a over clause here that means that you are going to treat the sum of salary as a windowing function what does a partition by do a partition by do is a part partition by is similar to your group by so it groups by the department id and then uh, gives the department total so as you see here the output looks like this whereas for a typical grouped aggregate there would be one row for this and for the second row second uh, group there will be one row and then the third group fourth group like that so as you see here for the first department id there's one person contributing to the salary so that that's the end of the first partition for the second partition which has uh, six rows you have the department totals and all the six rows being a part of the final result set so this is a very simple use case for a windowing function a windowing function can be leveraged to do many many things more i have another example wherein uh, in the previous example you just saw the entire partition being considered to give you the final total whereas in this example you see that you are actually calculating the total only for the rows that are um only for two rows that are preceding the current row so you can specify that too inside the partition how many rows do i actually uh, uh, want to look into so here you have sum of salary over partition by similar to what i had in the previous example order by the name then rows two preceding so what happens in this case so the first partition which has only null only one row so you get the department total for the second partition that's the first row it doesn't have any rows preceding it so you have null because the salary is null for the second uh, row you have one row ahead of it so you consider that as well and then for the third row you have two rows preceding now when you are moving to the fourth row of the partition you are not going to consider the first rows uh, value so it's going to aggregate only for these three rows because you have specified i want to look at rows that are pre, uh, only two rows that are preceding me so that that way you can leverage windowing functions to do whatever you want mostly used by analytics and it's not only the aggregates that can be used as windowing functions there are a lot of other new windowing functions that have been introduced like ranks row number lead lag like you can say that you know who is leading this row who is lagging behind me all those things you can there a lot of new sql syntax as part of windowing functions you can leverage all of them so most of the sql standard syntax for windowing functions has been supported by mysql in 8.0 so you can see that for every row it will just consider so since it's a new partition you just consider those <coughs> so these are the two major uh, sql uh, syntaxes that are introduced in 8.0 so the next important um, step that is taken for 8.0 is making the default car set change so for 5.7 we had uh, utf8 mb3 and for uh, uh a dot o it's been changed to utf8 mb4 so uh, what does that mean that means that uh, you can actually store many more characters that includes emojis as well so all these can be sorted and then 
uh, all the things that a mobile app now requires is being supported in 8.0. So I can see some smiles. So <laughs> somebody is happy <laughs> and it has, it, it has performance improvement as well. So that is something that you can look forward to. And the next uh, feature that we have added is a very simple syntax, but most commonly required by um, a booking system. So, so the most common problem that you see is hot row contention when multiple threads are trying to uh, look at the same rows. So we have provided two solutions for this problem in a.o. The first one being you can skip, the application can have a logic to skip the rows that are locked or you can say that I do not want to wait for the lock. So the first syntax that we have provided here is uh, skip locked and in the next slide I will show you the no wait. So I will give you an example of how it can be used in your business logic. Say so for example I have a booking system like in a movie or something like that. The first thread comes and then he looks at a couple of seats and he picks up the seats and then he is in the process of payment. Now the, when the next thread comes the business logic needs that it should not look at this locked rows. I can actually skip this locked rows because the first thread is actually in the process of payment. So this, uh, you can actually issue just this command saying that whatever the seats that are not being not, not there in somebody else's cart, you just have to give me those rows. So this is a new syntax that is being given which can be used in your business logic. It's very simple. Uh, and the next one is the no wait logic. So that, uh, the no wait syntax is just similar to the previous one except that you are not skipping the locks. Uh, locked rows, you are just not waiting for the lock to be released. So that's about it. So this is a new uh, syntax that's been provided. And the next is the JSON functions. So uh, as you all know that MySQL 5.7 has the JSON support and it is the most well received uh, feature that uh, um, for 5.7 as well. So we have what we have done in 8.0 is made some more improvements to this JSON functionality. So we have given some more uh, JSON functions that can be leveraged uh, in many different ways for you to take advantage of. So I will just go through the most important functions that were introduced. The first one is the JSON aggregation functions. So JSON array ag. Uh, so I'm not going to cover how to create a JSON object and all those things. It's just the new functionality. So what we have is uh, here a table having a JSON column. And what we have here is how to, uh, how, what kind of output you get when you use a JSON array aggregate. So it has aggregated all the JSON uh, key value pairs, pairs into an array. So uh, this can be used in your applications in many ways. And the next is the uh, JSON object aggregation, uh, which can be used to uh, create a, a JSON object. Uh, I mean, the previous one was for your creation of an array. This is for just the objects. So as you see here, you can use it in your group by queries to just get the list of uh, all the objects that are present in your group. So that way you can leverage it. Um, so this is something that is uh, that can be used in many ways, the JSON table function. So it's the most powerful syntax that is provided for uh, JSON functionality in a.o. So what, um, what this can do is convert your regular JSON documents into relational data. So I have an example. I'll, I'll just go through the example so that you can understand better. So I have a table here with a, which has a JSON column having all the people's data. It's just unstructured and there is a lot of fields and everything uh, pertaining to people's data. But uh, what I, what the application is interested in is just the names and the addresses. So what now with JSON table function, what you can do is extract these two and then interpret as a relational data. So we have this syntax now. So select, start from T1, JSON table. Then the first uh, argument is your JSON data, so from where the JSON data comes from. So in this particular case, table T1, JSON call, I'm looking at the column data, and in the column data, the path for the actual data that I'm looking at for extraction of columns is people's data. So inside this JSON column, what I'm looking at is people's data, from which I'm going to create two columns, named uh, the first one being the name for which I have a path, 
the second one is the address for which I have a path again. And you can also use your filtering. So this creates this creates the relational data that can be later leveraged to use, do aggregations and everything. So I have one more example. So the previous one, what you saw was a simple one wherein you know you have you did not have any nested paths. But this one, you have some nested paths. That is, you have uh, people's data where the father's name, mother's name, then children and children are in turn having name, age, everything. So how do you extract data from nested paths? So See, here I have an example where all this data can be interpreted as a relational table like this. So this has uh, a, a, a row representing every child in the data and their age. And then the, there's an ID that is auto-generated for the rows. And then whether the, the marriage date, if at all it is present, then you know reflect as one. And then the father name. So how do you do this? So you just have to write the syntax. So JSON table. This is the column that I'm looking at, families. And I'm going to look at all the data inside this families uh, column. And then I'm going to create these many columns from this data. So the first one being the ID for ordinality. This is auto-generated by MySQL. So it gives you the column numbers so that you know you, you will be able to identify. And then the next column is the father column. So that path is father inside this. And then married. If the marriage date exists, then I want it to be reflected. If the marriage does, uh, date doesn't exist, then it's going to be zero. So then inside that, I have a nested path of children's data. So inside this data, I'm looking at children's data. And in the chi from the children's data, I'm going to create three uh, uh, columns, name the child ID again for ordinality, then child, that's the name, and then the age. So you'll get this relational data, which is human readable and can be used to leverage, or can be used to do aggregations, and so on and so forth. So I'll just show you how, how you can use it for aggregations here. So you have the same JSON table definition that I had in the previous uh, slide. Using this, what I'm doing here is select the father's name, and then the counts are how many children does he have. So from inside this data, I'm going to count the number of children, and then the average age of the children. So what it does is it, it gives you a, a mechanism to interpret the unstructured data into structured data. And from there, you leverage all the functionality that your typical SQL can give. So this is very powerful if at all you're you know, interested in uh, uh, relational data interpretation from your unstructured data. So that is something that is new in uh, 8.0. Uh, so next we have. Um, couple of index extensions, the first one being the invisible index. So typically a DBA, what he would want to do is, he would want to check whether any of the indexes are used correctly or not. So if at all, the, if he finds that uh, the index is not, usable, not used by any of the applications, he would like to drop the index. But it so happens that when he tries to drop the index, what if the performance gets a hit? So what now with 8.0, what he can do is make this index invisible to optimizer alone. So when you insert data, update data, all the physical um, changes will happen to the index. But only thing is, optimizer is not going to pick this index for its plan generation. So, uh, so what this does is, uh, after you make this index invisible, one can check whether there is a performance drop. So if there is a performance drop, that means that this index is actually used by the application logic. Uh, so he can you know, make it visible again, and then start using the index. Or otherwise, if he thinks that the performance is not uh, dropped at all after making it is in invisible, then he can just drop, decides to drop the index. So that is one of the index extension. And the second one is the descending index. So all the up to MySQL 5.7, what we had support was for ascending index. That means physically, when an index is stored, it is always in the ascending order. Now, um, whenever an uh, application requi uh, required a descending order, what uh, MySQL used to do was scan it backwards. So the scanning backwards always has a performance uh, hit for about 15 to 20% uh, is what we observed. So that is one thing. And the second thing is that since we did not have a way to store uh, indexes in descending order, for any query which had order by A ascending, B descending, 
mixed order, we could never use an index. MySQL could never use an index. It used to always sort it after fetching the data and then sort it at the server layer. So now you can uh, create an index like this, A descending and B ascending. And then if at all you have an ordering that is like requires mixed order, you can leverage that. So that is something that is done. So the next is the cost model change. So in 5.7, uh, we did uh, some of a couple of major changes to our cost model in Optimizer. In 8.0, in 8.0, uh, we have improved upon it. I think my colleague covered uh, one of it as uh, histograms in the morning. So this 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 is the second one that has been done. So in 5.7 and earlier, for Optimizer to know if the data is present in um, in memory or on the disk, there was no way. So the storage engine was not capable to capable of telling how much of the data actually resides in memory or how much of the data actually resides in data. I mean uh, disk. So with this, what happens is uh, that you know you always presume that the data is residing in disk, and based on that, you come up with the cost. So the plan might not be always optimal. So now with Adoto, storage engine is able to tell how much percent actually resides in memory and how much percent actually resides in disk. So because of that, we are able to come up with better plans. And I think uh, one of the DBT3 query, uh, which is a standard for measuring uh, benchmarking, has actually improved uh, after we introduced this cost model change. So the next is the hints. OK, so as I said earlier, 5.7, we introduced new cost model. So a lot of times when optimizer is uh, has made some changes we see that 99% of the queries actually improve in performance but there are uh, very rare cases that you know you see a regression so what what is the solution for a regression is that the dba can himself give a hint to the optimizer saying that i do not want you to think i just want you to use this index for this particular query so in uh, 5.7, we introduce a lot of hint infrastructure, wherein for every kind of optimization that an optimizer uh, uh, uses, you actually can give a hint saying that I do not want you to use this um, index extension, or I want you to use this index uh, uh, optimization. So in 8.0, we have improved upon the hint uh, infrastructure. Uh, we, ha we now have a couple of uh, uh, hints for um, join order specification. So fixed order and then join order. You can just specify a prefix for the entire uh, join uh, that you have, or a suffix, so on and so forth. I just have an example you can just see here. So what we have here is uh, a select query which uh, joins on two tables. So the default, if, if at all you think that you know this is a join order that is preferable for you, you can just mention in your query saying that join order. First, the table should be customer, and the second table should be orders. So if there are uh, plenty of tables in your query, you can always specify the prefix should be something, and then the suffix should be something, and then this you can just say fixed order, do not change anything about it. So that can be done. And so that's about what I had in my agenda. But there are a lot of uh, important features that have been added along with what I have covered. Since I do not have time, <laughs> I've just listed <laughs> all the features here that are um, there as part of 8.0, so the, we have improved uh, GIS support. So 5.7, you saw a major change in um, geometry support for um, in MySQL. So we have improved upon what uh, we did in 5.7. There's a grouping function, which can uh, differentiate between roll-up nulls and uh, regular uh, nulls. And then, as I said, improved hint infrastructure. It's not only the join order um, hints that have uh, been added. There's a lot many index merge and plenty of hints that have been added in 8.0. And then there's JSON improvements. So it's not only the functions that I mentioned that are uh, added in a dotto. There are plenty of others as well. Utility functions like JSON pretty print and uh, storage size and so on and so forth. And then uh, we have also improved upon performance because we now have a way to detect whether a JSON can be partially updated or not. So that that's another performance improvement that we have done and then there's parser refactoring which always helps us to add new sql syntax with ease and because of which we have actually added a lot of sql syntax uh, newly in 8.0 because there's a lot of parser refactoring that is happening there, um, the original parser of 5.5 uh, is no more what you see in 8.0 or 5.6 or 5.7 i mean it's gradually improved so that's 
that's about my presentation. If you have any questions, just yeah. Yes, we have first value, last value, nth value. Uh, window functions? Yeah. No, it's I. Not part of the MySQL kernel or is the storage? MySQL server. No, it's a server. Yes, it's a server. It's a server. Uh, so, which means I can use this functions for any storage? Or Should be. It's uh, a pluggable uh, uh, interface, right? What we have in um, uh, with respect to MySQL. So, this is a server feature. So, you should be able to leverage it with any. Yeah. So, all it needs is uh, temp table changes, but. Uh, I'm not sure. See, with my with respect to what we have is in a DB and MySAM and couple of other uh, that Oracle supports. So we have had couple of uh, changes for uh, temporary table handling for windowing functions. So as long as uh, those are done, then I, I should I think you should be able to leverage it with any of the storage engines. But the recommended one, as I said, is in a DB. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I wouldn't want a transactional. Okay, so in non-transactional engine, if you want to do it, I think you should be able to do it. Yeah. How does this JSON function work? So in from the engine, you're able to read the JSON file and then convert it into no, it's structures. no, it's it's stored as uh, uh, in a binary format in our storage engine as a column itself. So from JSON, you first import it. Uh, from from the storage engine. We just read the, we have an interpretation of uh, the binary format and then we give it out as a SQL uh, readable Basically format. The JSON data type. So, the so there is. The so, <coughs> JSON data type is on the disk or where is it? It's, so like it's a. Data type, data type, you have blobs, right? You have binary large objects large. and then uh, you have uh, just the character, uh, varchar. So either if you want to interpret as a text, you can use the varchar uh, this thing, or otherwise JSON in general in uh, MySQL is stored as a binary logic blob. I mean it's similar to. Store the entire JSON record in the database. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you just I, extract I there it. There is a JSON file on the disk, and your engine is reading it. And no, no, no. It's it's part of the it's part of the right. table. It's part of the table structure itself. You can create a JSON column and insert the JSON documents into it. We actually had a session. At Explaining the same thing that you how to how you can leverage SQL and no SQL in my SQL. Yeah. So yeah. you can go through the slides that yeah. 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 Yeah.